what we have here is Moon Mapper 1. I am also copying over this new program called X-Man. This is going to be definitely a KOS centric episode. So we'll see how it does. Okay, three, two, one, and... Hello, my name is Mike Aben and welcome to episode 21 of Permanent Presence. All right, so what do I mean by permanent presence? Um, I've been getting some comments, and actually, quite frankly, I agree with them, is what this series needs is a direction, a goal, an ultimate goal. I always, with these series, just get start to play KSP, and then I start to just play and see where we end up, and usually I end up fizzling out down the road at some point. That's been my, play, my common theme to my other series. But I think setting ourselves a goal would help give this series a direction. Now, what should the goal be? I mean, in KSP, we have lots and lots of goals, and I realize that it shouldn't be just one goal. It should be many goals. So this is what I've decided to do. I'm going to take this series and split it into seasons. We are currently in season one, and each of these seasons is going to have its own individual goal. And this season is entitled Permanent Presence. And the goal? The goal is to establish a permanent purple presence in space. I want to basically create like our, our, the Kerbal version of the International Space Station. I want to make it absolutely clear I am not building a redo of the International Space Station. What I want to do is basically establish kind of the same thing but whatever form that ends up taking in this particular game. I want to have a station in low Kerbin orbit and it's going to be permanently crewed. Now keep in mind I do have Kerbalism going in this game so we have to think about how all that resource stuff is going to happen. And that's going to be the goal of this season. And then once that goal is established, this season ends and we'll end up spending another, we'll end up going into another season, season two, different goal. Perhaps the second goal, the goal for season two, haven't really thought that far ahead yet, but maybe it's going to be to get into resource harvesting within the Kerbin system and start to establish a bit of independence for our Kerbals that are out there in space. I don't know. And if you have an idea on what you would like to see in subsequent seasons, please drop a comment. Let me know. Some of the best ideas I find in the comments. I am willing to steal anything. And if you're enjoying this whole series, by all means, drop a like. Don't forget to subscribe. If it's your thing, hit that notifications bell. And if you really, really like what it is that I'm doing and would like to ensure that they continue on for a long, long time, I do have a Patreon page linked down there in the description. But right now, let's talk about what's going on in this episode. So what we have here is Moon Mapper 1. And Moon Mapper 1, well as the name implies, its job is to do a moon map. It's going to be using the scan Satmon, a low resolution altimetry scan of the moon. So clearly that is where we are going. What else is new is if we kind of jump back to just before this launch and take a look at me copying my programs into the KOS processor that's aboard this vehicle. Um, I'm copying over my normal ascent script, which you just saw complete its mission. And I am also copying over this new program called X-Man. So what might our X-Man script do? Does it shoot force beams out of its eyes? Have claws leap out of its hands? Oh, of course not. Some of you are probably guessing already what it's going to do, but you know what? We'll get this thing inserted, and then we'll talk about what it does. Now, this craft actually has a sister craft, Minmus Mapper 1. Actually, it's a little more than a sister craft, to be painfully honest. It is actually an identical craft to this one. I got really lazy. It's kind of remarkable how similar the Delta V budgets are for going to the moon and going for Minmus. So I just pushed two of these into the building queue, and actually that one will be completed right on the heels of this one, though it probably won't be until next episode that we'll see the sister craft to this one launch. Uh, because in this episode, we're going to talk a lot about KOS. This is going to be definitely a KOS-centric episode. 
All right. Okay, there we go. That is our orbit. Uh, let's take a look at this mysterious X-Men. I'm just so much in the habit of after I uh, of closing this terminal window after I did my uh, after that send program finished. I forgot, of course, I got another one. So let's bring it back. So let's edit X-Men. <laughs> And why is there no X-Man list? Only Ascend. Copy path. That was weird. Did I just do something wrong and just not notice it? Zero colon X-Man. There might have been an error that I completely missed. Now edit X-Man. I don't know if I'm running into memory issues. Like, maybe that's the problem. Delete path. Ascend. So I'm deleting the Ascend program. I can't be into memory issues. Oh, yeah, I am. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. i got to think about that now. Now let's copy path. So it gives you no message. Oh, that's what happened. Now list. Now I have the X-Men scare. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I can see it here. So, like, for instance, here you can see the size of the Ascend script is 3,766. I'm assuming that's bytes. And I only have 1,234 remaining, but the X-Men script is 2,847 bytes. Okay, there's something to think about. So it would have, it didn't fit. I'm surprised it doesn't give you any kind of a warning. So, but thankfully I was able to delete the Ascent script now that I don't need it anymore. And I can bring up the X-Man script and now we can finally edit X-Man. Maybe there were warnings, I just wasn't. There it is! <laughs> Alright, let's spend a little bit of time taking a look at the X-Man script. And you know what? I know not everybody's into like coding and KOS and all that kind of stuff. So if you're not interested in this, I will put a link down that you can just skip, skip ahead in, uh, and get to the actual, this thing in action. But as you can see from the top, this is a maneuver node ex uh, edit ex executor. Now that I have the tracking station upgraded, I can now use maneuver nodes. And the logical thing seems to me would be to have a script that can execute those nodes for me. Uh, I put a little bit on to do list. There's still some things I want to build. This thing is freaking big enough as it is, but I, there are some things I want to add to the to do list. It got way bigger than I thought it would. Uh, one is this can't handle staging events yet. Ooh, that's interesting. So I'll have to do the staging. Okay. Uh, you know what? I th okay. Uh, this might not be the best test for this thing. No, it won't. I also want to, because this will definitely stage part way through here. Um, the other thing it will, yeah, I want to do is manage, you know what, I'm going to abandon all this. Yeah, this isn't going to work right now. I was thinking maybe I could just run it and then just, I will stage it manually, but it's more than just that. It has to perform calculations, like for instance, it has to calculate the burn time and it it's not set up to do that right across multiple stages. It will do that calculation wrong, so it'll completely mess up the burn if I run this. So, yeah. But we'll see this run this episode. I mean, this thing's going to have to do a correction burn on its way out to the moon. We'll, we'll, we'll test it for the first time then. Uh, we also have to do a capture about the moon, so we'll use the X-Man script again once there. So you'll get some opportunities to see this thing in action. But I think right now our best plan is to get ourselves to the moon. So we're going to set the moon as a target. And the goal with this burn is to hit the moon smack dab in the middle. Now clearly that's not going to be my end game plan. <laughs> and you can tell when you hit it right in the middle because you want these two will line up with each other. The sort of going in and going out though there obviously would be no going out. Uh, let's scale down this to 0.1 meters per second. Okay. Oh, this way. Beautiful. 
All right, so that's hitting the moon pretty close to being smack dab in the middle. There we go, and again, the all too familiar ant engine, which is going to take a little bit to complete the rest of this burn. Yeah, if I ran the script, it would have calculated the length of the burn, I'm pretty sure, on the uh, torch engine that was just on that upper stage and clearly would have completely messed up how long this burn was going to take, so I'm very glad I didn't try and do that. Familiar looking probe, a little bit, very much like the mapping probe that's go around Kerbin right now. Really the only difference is a little bit extra fuel to get me out to the moon, so three of our basketballs rather than two. Whack. Nice. Okay, that's good. Close that. Now, clearly this isn't what we're going to do. We're going to do a correction burn part way along here. So we'll add a maneuver node here. And uh, let's see, we're coming, we're going to go northwards because you can see our incoming trajectory is more north than south. And let's see here, that's set up pretty small. Let's give us some bit of delta B here. There we go. So we got to do a little bit, well, reasonable correction. All right, now what I like to do is actually play a bit with the timing of this to see does going earlier push me out further? No, it actually pushes me not as far out. So the burn should be later. So you want to move the time here until this periapsis is at its maximum and that'll give you close to the right time. Because there's a right spot. You know, it's not super duper critical, but like if you wait, you know, the further you are from curb and the better, but of course if you wait to too late then you can't affect your trajectory enough. So. It is, there is a right spot to do it. Okay, now we do still need to come up northwards because I want to go into a 250 kilometer orbit. So we're going to push this up further until we are at a 250 kilometer orbit. There are no orbital parameters on this contract, so I'm just picking 250 because the maximum... The maximum is uh, the maximum range of the ScanSat low all, low res altimeter is 500 kilometers. So I just went to that in half. There we are. That looks good. Okay. And there's actually always a little bit. I always find is it better when you're coming into a body and you want to insert yourself into a particular orbit, is it better to set your periapsis at that altitude uh, and then just circularize there to get it what you want? Or is it better to take more advantage of the O-birth effect, come in really low, get sh then, then start to burn, do your capture burn to your apoapsis is at their desired altitude and then come around and circularize there? And the answer to that question is it depends. Now, to be honest, around the moon, you're really nitpicking. It has to do with actually how fast are you coming in. The faster you're coming in, the better the O-birth effect is going to help you, and it has to do with the mass of the object. The moon, it's interesting out of all of Kerbin's objects, it actually, there's an altitude where it's better to do one, and then there's an altitude where you're below, it's better to do the other. Uh, and But the difference is so minor, I'm just going to do this because it's simpler. Uh, Min-miss, it's always better to just do it like this. Uh, when you get into bigger bodies, like for instance, Jewel especially would be the king example. It's way better to come in and take advantage of the Oberth effect. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's take a look at, now that this is all set. Actually, let's get out alarm clock first of all, because I want to make sure nothing else is coming. We're going to set an alarm for this burn it's in an hour and 20 minutes so we'll most certainly be doing it oh way before we get yeah so let's uh let's finish this off but we can now do where is kos there we go 
we can now take a look at edit X-Man. Finally, let's take a look at this. We're going to execute it. We're going to I'm going to show you it work to execute this particular burn and we'll show it again when we go to do our capture burn and get our mapping started. So, let's go over what this does and how it works. So, uh, again, it's it, it executes maneuver nodes. So, here's the main function and X-Man, uh, you know, get execute maneuvers right i don't know i had to come up with something i guess i could have been more cryptic and called it cyclops or something but i this i don't know i thought it was funny so the first thing it does do is it checks if and then it says has node and has node is is there a node up ahead in our flight path yes or no if the answer is yes it's going to go ahead and do this stuff to execute that node if the answer is false up here then it's going to go to this else and it's going to print out no node in flight path and actually that will end the program the program will end after that so that's a bit of a safety i don't know in case stop it from doing something stupid if you happen to call it when there's no node out there uh let's see we clear the screen turn sas off whenever you get kos to adjust your ship turn off sas because kos and sas will fight with each other um Start reduce time is two seconds. So two seconds before the burn is done, it's going to start to reduce throttle. That's what that's about. That's just a hard coded thing that'll come up later. Um, set M node, that's maneuver node to next node. So next node is a key word that is built into KOS that represents, not surprisingly, the next node. It's gonna st store the data associated with that maneuver node. That is, when is it? how much prograde, how much normal, and how much radial in the burn. It's gonna store that information in a, in a variable called M node that we're gonna use repeatedly throughout this. Then we're going to set the start time, the time to start the burn, um, to, and then we have our first function here called calculate start time of this maneuver node, and it also needs to know this start reduce time. It factors that into it. So let's take a look at calculating the start time. It's Pretty simple actually that's one of the shorter ones okay so it takes parameters uh, that would just pass down here and it's going to return time seconds that's how much time is right now it's going to add on from the M node there is a built-in structure called an ETA how far ahead in seconds is the maneuver node then it's going to subtract the burn time that's another function that's a little more complicated divided by two Okay, and then it's going to also subtract the start reduce time also divided by two and that's when it's gonna start the burn. Okay, let's take a look at calculating the burn time. This is one of the more involved pieces of this thing. So here's our function for calculating the burn time. I'm a little bit surprised it can't call the number, at least I couldn't figure out how to call the number that KSP already has calculated for us. So we're gonna have to calculate it. So it takes this maneuver node. I have a variable here called delta V. And that's going to be the delta V of the burn. The delta V of the burn is the maneuver node. It takes the burn vector from the maneuver node. That's the, that's the vector that represents uh, the actual burn itself. And it takes the magnitude. That's the delta V of the burn. It stores that piece of information, a variable called del V. If VISP, so this stands for vessel ISP, it's another function. If the vessel ISP is less than zero, what that means is that I have no engines active. If that's the case, it's going to skip over all this kind of stuff. Um, oh no, if it's less than zero, it's going to print no active engines. This is another safety thing. And then it's going to wait for you. The program doesn't end. It's going to wait for you to do something to fix the vessel ISP and get it greater to be zero, which usually means activating your engines. The ISP function is down here. This is a uh, calculates the ISP. I'll leave it for you. There's a bit of math involved in this one. Um, I don't want to get into it too much. I guess the main thing here is there is this, uh, we get all the engines. This is a nice feature in KOS. Engines represents all the engines that are on the ship. So if we get a list of all the engines and store that into a list called engine list, we can then use a for loop to iterate through that engine list. And then it, for every engine we find, we're going to see number one, 
does it have ignition? In other words, is it on? Because if it's one of our later engines, we don't want to count it. Um, and then it's going to, for that engine, it does some calculating involving the thrust and the ISP to actually calculate what the total ISP of the whole, if you have a ton of engines going, it will calculate the correct ISP. And then it returns that value. So that returns the combined ISP of all the engines that are active. If um, this sum is greater than zero, it performs the calculation, but if the sum two is less th is not greater than zero, what that means is there's no engines active, so it returns a negative one, and that's the flag way up here that's, that uh, would get it to, if, if this is, um, that would get it to recognize that no engines are active and print this message. Anyway, after that, we're gonna perform the, cal the calculations to calculate what the burn time is, I'm not going to go into it too much. Maybe this is something for a future let's do the math thing. Um, there is uh, rocket equations involved and Newton's laws are involved. Actually, only Newton's second law, so it's not that complicated. Uh, but it does calculate how much burn time this is going to take. All right, so that's the burn time calculation. Let's go back up. We were, I lost track of where we were. I think that's calculating all from, start, calculate the start time of the burn. Uh, set the start vector to maneuver node burn vector. This is going to get used later. This is the way we are pointing. This is the way the node is pointing and we're going to just store that information to a variable called start vector. We're going to lock the steering to the node. Again, that is a not very complicated function down here. Yep, launch pad is reconditioned. That's great. Uh, where is lock steering to the node? There it is here. It's not that complicated. Lock steering to the maneuver node burn vector. And then it just prints a message saying that we've just locked it. Uh, start the burn. So start the burn is another function down here. Start burn, start burn. Where is start burn? Can't be. There it is. Again, these are in no particular order. So start burn, it takes the start time as a parameter. It waits until the time in seconds is greater than the start time minus three. The reason why I have a minus three is because I got a countdown. We're gonna start the burn in three, two, one. So it takes three seconds to do the countdown, locking throttle to full, and then throttle gets locked to full. That's all there is to starting the burn. Go up, going up. Where are we at now? That was start the burn. Then we get to the reduce throttle. Reducing the throttle. I didn't want the throttle just to suddenly cut off, so I built a reduce throttle function. It takes the maneuver node, it takes the start reduce time. Remember, that's the time we're gonna start reducing the function. It waits until the burn time from the node. So that's keeping track of how much burn time is left with the maneuver node, again, from that burn time calculation. And once that is less than the start reduce time, which is two seconds, once this is less than two seconds, then it's gonna continue on. And it's gonna print, print out blank line, print reducing the throttle. And then I have an equation for reducing the throttle. Again, I don't wanna go into this all too much. I can leave people that are interested in those things to explore it for themselves. Hopefully they can see figure out how it's all working. And by all means, feel free to ask me any questions that you might have in the comments, but I'm not gonna go through all the math in detail. But the end result is, is that uh, over a period of some time, it's gonna actually take now more than two seconds. It's gonna quickly reduce the throttle from one down to 0.1. Just, you know, in, a, in, a, in a three or four seconds, it's gonna take. Um, and then it, just to make sure it's at point one, at the very end, it locks the throttle to point one. All right, we're almost there. So now we're almost at the end of the burn. We have reduced our throttle. Where are we at here? And then end the burn, end the burn. Now, this, how do I know when the burn is done? My initial, whoops, would simply be to wait for the amount of delta V left in the burn to drop below a certain threshold. Um, but I was watching a little bit of Cheers Kevin great KOSer, um, and and I know this is what he did is he waited for 
You know when you get towards the end of the burn, that burn vector starts to move? If that deviates from the start vector by more than a certain amount, that's how he decided that he was going to end the burn. And the advantage of that is, we've all seen that if we're not quite on the burn, you'll never get that burn quite down to zero, right? You might get it down to like a small number and then it starts to creep back up again. And if that small number is above your threshold for cutting it off, well, your burn's not gonna stop. And you can end up overshooting your burn very, very easily. In fact, you can turn into a mess very quickly. But if you just keep track of your start vector and then you wait until um, maneuver complete, again, this is a, another, another function here and it takes the the uh, maneuver node as it is right now and the start vector. Where did maneuver complete go? Oh dear. Maneuver complete, where are you? Maneuver. There it is, there's maneuver complete. It takes these two and it calculates the vector angle. That's what Vang is between those two. And if that v angle between what we started burning at and what the burn vector is at now turns out to be greater than five, we're just gonna stop. That's the cue to stop. I like that because there's no way that you'll crazily overburn it under that. Situation. So I thought that was a clever way to do it. And then once, then it just prints burn complete, sets the throttle to zero, unlocks the steering, uh, removes the node from the game, waits five seconds, and then the program is just going to end. That's it. All right, so let's see this thing in action by actually time warping towards our burn. And we'll see how this does. Now remember, I want a periapsis of 250 kilometers. So let's see how close it gets. Let's see how it does. Uh, so we're simply going to run X-Man. It takes no parameters. It's just that. Boink. There we go. So we are now locking onto our burn vector. Actually, I happen to have already been pretty much pointing to it. So it just adjusted the roll, which was unnecessary, but I let it do it anyway. Uh, and again, one of the things it can't do is handle staging. That's why I'm waiting now that it's just down to a single stage. And the other thing I want to be able to do is it to handle the time warping. I thought that would be nice too, but I haven't wrapped my head around that. So we're just going to time warp ourselves here a little bit till we're close to the burn. Now this is a very short burn and I did not test it on short burns. So, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Okay, we're just about 10 seconds away. Doesn't quite do it when KSP says it should do it. Oh, starting burn, 3, 2, 1. And we're off. Actually, it did do it pretty much right on when KSP said it would do it. That's interesting. And we should be getting to the reduced throttle part. There it is, reducing the throttle. Yeah, oh, that might be a little bit too... Ah, and there we go, we're done. How did we do? I don't know. Let's take a look. There's our periapsis. I don't think... I To me, that's that ain't bad. That ain't bad. I'm kind of happy with that show. I'm not even going to give it puffs. I'll track... I'll, uh, I'll uh, fix this when we get into the moon's sphere of influence. Oh, there we are. There we are. Okay, still not collecting any data. What did I set this thing for? Did I forget to turn this stuff on? That's entirely possible. Where's my probe core hiding in there? There is a probe core, I promise. What do we got here? Did I not cue any of this stuff? Oh, the mic can only be done with a body with the atmosphere? Well, that's just silly. Well, now I know. Okay, the site experiment, I'll start running. The mite experiment is useless. I now have the probe updated that it actually can run two experiments and I picked one of them to be a useless experiment. I didn't know, whatever. I'm sure it says that somewhere and I just flat out didn't pay attention. Okay, let's uh, reduce our periapsis by just burning a little bit radially inwards. Shouldn't be much. That's beautiful. Okay, that's good. And let's put this back pointing up so it can collect some nice rays. There we are. 
What is our inclination? 89.97. That ain't bad for eyeballing it, I think. All right, let's build us another maneuver node. Now, here's where you can start to see I'm not quite on the periapsis because the periapsis is moving away on me. So what I can do is if I move this down to just going up by single seconds and bring that periapsis back. That's how you can dial that right on. There we go. Now one thing actually, before I go any further, I don't think this is going to be an issue. No, I'll have communication the whole way. But what's really cool about using KOS or something like this to perform your burns is if I set the program running before I reach, go into the communi communication shadow, it will execute the burn anyway. So that makes this really useful given that I have it set up so that if I go into communication shadow, I have zero probe control. All right. So, again, we're going to run X-Man. Boom. All right. And again, I've never, have not put this through a huge amount of testing. So, not I never circularized with it. So, we'll see, see how it does. Okay. Three, two, one, and go. Take about 40 seconds to do the burn. Normally, I don't even use maneuver nodes for this kind of stuff. I just do it using information from Kerbal Engineer or going to map mode or even use this information. But this is kind of cool. I like this. Alright, so when we're about two seconds from the end there, it should start reducing the throttle. There it goes. Might play with that a little bit. I don't know. I guess it's okay. It certainly takes its time. And there we go. Our burn is complete. How did we do? So, apoapsis 250.127 kilometers, periapsis 249.914 kilometers. Better than probably I would have done, so I'm pretty happy with that. All right, let's start our scanner. Oh, I should have also started, oh well, I was about saying, I should have sort of rolled out the Minmus 1, but Let's start this first. So there goes our scanner. It's going to start doing its job. It's collecting some science. But more importantly, it's going to give us a nice map of the moon. No biomes going to be on the map. A later scanner will actually do biome scans and allow you to see all the biomes. But looking at the time, I think we are coming to the end of this episode. Yep, it was one mission, one episode this time. But I hope you did enjoy it. And I hope to see you again next time.